Hey, all right, happy Easter to everyone. It's Easter 2023. We are 23 years into the 21st century. And this Easter finds us in a strange new world. We are now living at a time where, how about this? Now the biggest proponent of verifiable facts and truth is the Christian church. And, and some of you, you might think, well, faith seems to go against reason. Or maybe it precedes reason. Listen, the Christ, Christian belief has always, always demanded facts and faith. And today we're going to talk about that. I want to just offer my welcome to everybody. I know we're packed in here at this hour. Some of you in overflow, and we, we we're grateful that you are you're here with us as well. We've got another service at 11 in the sanctuary if you want to join us there. Some of you remember, during you're old enough to remember this, um, way back in the 20th century. How many of y'all were alive in the 20th century? So um, back in the 80s, so <laughs> like way back, um, there was a Cold War going on between us and Russia, then the Soviet Union. Um, and, and during that time, it, it was a kind of chess match between us and Russia um, as to, you know, regarding the, the disarmament of nuclear weapons. During that time, President Reagan um, grabbed hold of a Russian uh, proverb, kind of a rhyming proverb, and he tossed it back to Gorbachev and to Russia, to the Soviet Union, and it was this, trust but verify. He was saying, okay, we're going to have good faith, we're going to trust each other, but we're going to verify everything that happens here. And let this be the Easter invitation. This is the in invitation to you. Trust and verify. Because we all know, you, you've seen the tectonic plate shifting. We all feel it. We sense it. Something has shifted in our culture. I referenced recently, it was in 2016, that uh, the word of the year for the Oxford Dictionary was post-truth, marking a tipping point in the global West that we now live in a post-truth culture. We're interesting. People don't believe in facts or truth anymore because it's your truth up against my truth. There's no ultimate truth. We talk about this often. And here's, here's the thing, though. On Easter Sunday, we're reminded that God did not simply pull this off, do all of this so that we can trust alone. He made it verifiable. On the morning that Jesus was crucified, he stood before Pilate, betrayed, beaten, bloodied. And Pilate asked the question that is the question in this secular age. What is truth? And today we're going to look at what it means that Jesus is he's still on trial. He's still on trial today. But watch this. Every skeptic, cynics, uh, poets, artists, politicians, even atheists cannot shake him. And today is the day of the final verdict. This is the day. And into the dark hole that is our post-truth culture. The words of Jesus echo into our culture and into our hearts today. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And that's either true or it's not. One or the other. So let me ask you this. How many of you, like me, have been summoned uh, to jury duty? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, I've talked to two on our staff this week who've been summoned. How many of you have actually, like me, served on a jury? How many of you served on a jury? Okay, so I was chosen as the foreman of the jury. Um, imagine that. But at one point, I mean, it was a little, you know, and then I offered the verdict, like out loud, and, and there he is. And he, you're guilty, bro. Like, you're so guilty. And I hope you don't remember me. Or like, I hope you don't track me down when you get out of jail. It's a little, little bit spooky. But today's the day of the final verdict. And hey, consider yourself summoned, okay, if you never have been, into this holy courtroom on this holy day 
summoned by God to be here. And you're like, no, Jeff, it's Easter Sunday. Of course I'm here. Okay, we got Easter egg. I'm going to brunch. I mean, it's going to be awesome. No, no, no. God has brought you here to speak into your heart today. I believe that for every person here, he summoned us because this day that marks the final verdict is the day of all days. And I want you to turn to John chapter 20. Okay, John 20, because as we've gathered as a jury in the discovery phase of this trial, it is reported that there are witnesses who claim they've seen Jesus alive. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at evidence. We're going to hear, hear testimonies from witnesses. We're going to offer a little cross-examination. I'm going I'm to challenge. The, I'm going to give you the charge. And then we're going to have a final verdict. And, and I want you to listen to the opening statements as we focus on three things. The evidence, the witness, and, and the final verdict. Listen to these opening statements in John chapter 20. And just listen. Just listen. You heard him earlier, but listen and imagine. On the first day, Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran. Imagine. And went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. This is John describing himself. I love that. I love that. That's every one of us who are in him, by the way. That's who you are. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. The two, oh, oh then, then Peter and the other disciples set out and went uh, toward the tomb. The two were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I love John throwing a little shade at Peter that he outran him in the 5K or whatever it was. Because that's what we do, right? Like he's just... He, anyway, he throws that in. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, impetuous Peter. He, he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. This is an interesting detail. This implies that the body was not just snatched out, was not just stolen, Someone was very methodical here, is why that detail is here. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. This word saw in the Greek is not the normal word for saw. Blepo is the normal word. This is the word theoreo. You hear it? It's to theorize. It's to look intently, to ponder and to comprehend. Trust and verify. For they had not yet understood the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. So now we have evidence. The empty tomb is evidence. Now, spoiler alert, there's more evidence to come, right? But the resurrection, here's the thing. The resurrection cannot be overstated in in the Christian faith. And it's why we all show up here, but it is the thing. First century, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then he goes on. He says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, meaning if Jesus just came to show us how to live good lives, love people well, and if we're to follow him and just try to do the same and live moral life and die... He says, we are most of all people to be pitied. Because if the resurrection didn't happen, friends, there's no Christian faith. Everything hinges on the resurrection. If Jesus is still dead, we are all dead. Spiritually dead and forever dead right now. And life makes no sense at all. If there's no savior, there's no forgiveness. There's no, watch this, there's no ultimate truth. There's no ultimate love. There there is no meaning to this life. If it's only temporal, secular, material, earthy life, then life has no purpose at all. And every thoughtful atheist, by the way, has landed right there. There is no purpose in this life. And if you think I'm overstating this a bit, you need to know, perhaps you know, that sin is a condition of the heart. We all know it. 
We can't rescue ourselves from ourselves. We need a savior. And everybody knows this. But we say this often. Jesus did not come to simply be our good example. This is key. He came to be our substitute. He came to live the perfect life for us because we couldn't. He did it for us. He died on the cross because we could not atone for our own sin. He was the perfect lamb of God who would take away our sin. He was buried and he was raised again so that all who believe would follow him in resurrection life. The first installment of the resurrection. Think about this. The Christian faith does not exist because we have a Bible. It's like your birth certificate. It points to something that's already happened. We wouldn't have the Bible if Jesus did not rise from the dead. Everything hinges on the resurrection. He was our substitute. He rose again. And so the Bible points to the event, the resurrection, the event of all history. See, all other religions say, you know, work harder, get better, do these things in order to appease God, to get to God. Only in Christianity, we have God coming to us in the person of Jesus to show us, to speak our language, right? And, and, and so here's what we do. We here at our church, we read the Bible. We're reading the Bible together. As Travis noted, pick up your bookmark and start tomorrow in the Psalms. We're going to do it together because, not because we want more knowledge. Yes, knowledge matters. Facts, but we want to follow Jesus. We don't want to know him. We want to be his apprentices. Once we come to faith, we want to follow him and be just like him as he's transforming us to become more and more like him. See, you can have knowledge of scripture. Watch this. And and, and without relationship, it just leads to self-righteousness. I say it to parents often. Rules without relationship breed rebellion in a child. Does the same for us. If you don't know him, you get in his word like we're doing so that our entire church family, all of us together, can come to know him and to walk with him. Now, back to the text. We've got, we got the empty tomb as evidence. Mary is our eyewitness. Now, she's the first eyewitness, but watch this. She hasn't yet seen Jesus, nor have the disciples yet seen him. Look at verse 11. But Mary stood weeping, how she loved him, weeping outside the tomb. Some of you have wept over the loss of a loved one. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other, the other at the feet. Now, listen, Jesus didn't need angels to move the stone away. Angels literally means messengers. They're here to say, come in, check it out. Trust and verify. And so she says, uh, or verse 13, 13, they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord. And I do not know where they have laid him. See, resurrection was not even in the minds of these first witnesses. When, so this is verse 14. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Okay, it's still dark, but none of us would have expected a dead man standing in front of us. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. Now, note the two questions. Why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? These are the questions of every human heart. This is the cry of of every human heart. Why are you weeping today? We all bring the challenges of this world, this broken world into this place today. Why are you sad? What are you grieving? What have you lost? What's broken? Why the pain in your life? But look at this, the second question is tied to the first. 
Whom are you looking for? Where are you prone to run? Who are you going to? Who's going to bring hope into your life? Look at this. The question is not what, how, or when. The question is whom. Who will rescue you from your sadness? Who will bring hope into your despair? Who will bring purpose to your life? Who are you looking for? Who are you running to in these days? And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. He knows Mary by name. Friends, listen, he knows you by name. Whether you have a relationship with him or not, he knows everything about you. And he loves you today. And you need to hear that. Verse 17, Jesus said to her, do not touch me because I have not yet ascended to the father, but go and tell my brothers and say to them, I love this. I am ascending to my father and your father, my God and your God. You tell them. Now, Mary has further evidence. Empty tomb. Now she has Jesus himself, but she's now, he tells her, go and tell. And she's to tell the disciples who watched him die. They know he's buried to tell them that he's alive. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Now, Mary is our witness, but she's just the first witness. But consider this. Mary's the first person to ever proclaim the resurrection, to tell anyone else that the resurrection has taken place. She's the first one. She's the first evangelist to the apostles. God chooses a woman to be the first First thing to share that Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, this is significant historically. Some of you know that women in a misogynist culture like that, women couldn't even stand to testify in the court of law. Celsus, who was an early uh, philosopher, Greek philosopher, he hated Christianity. And one of his attacks on Christianity was Mary Magdalene. And he wrote this. Hang on. How can anyone expect rational men to listen to the testimony of a historic, uh, hysterical female? He, again, he lived in a very misogynist culture. And so historians have noted that no one would have ever put this in the story. The only plausible explanation that every gospel writer says women were the ones who saw him first and went to tell is because that's exactly what happened. It's exactly what happened. And sadly, this is significant in our day for people who are still trying to silence women. But you need, we're raising up women. We're raising up our girls to follow Jesus and know him, to be servant leaders, to be theologians, to be teachers, to be deacons, to be preachers and ministers and missionaries because clearly Jesus did not genderize the Great Commission. He said, everybody go. And then about 20 years after the resurrection, there was a public document that was circulating. We call it 1 Corinthians. And in it, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, he lays out what, what, what was a statement of faith in the early church. In fact, you'll see and hear the core of this is, became the Apostles' Creed. And he writes this. He says, I'm delivering to you uh, what is of first importance. Meaning, this is it. This is the priority. What I've received, I deliver to you that Christ died for our sins in accordance with Scripture. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to 500 people at one time. This is not mass hallucination. He appeared to to individuals, to small groups. And then he says this. Many are still alive today. Like he lives over there. She lives there. You can go there. Trust and verify. They will tell you exactly what happened. So Mary told the apostles 
They see Jesus. They go tell others one person at a time. And friends, this message of the resurrection has come into your life and you're hearing it from me again today. Because the message has gone forth. Let me ask you today. Do you believe? Do you believe? We've seen evidence. We have witnesses, hundreds and now thousands and billions of witnesses. So what is the final verdict? What is your decision? This is the point at which the resurrection of Jesus, now here it is, here's the connection, impacts your life today and every day. Paul, again, in the book of Romans, in chapter 6, he explains how we are now inextricably linked to Jesus. And here's what he says. He says, if you are in him, if you're covered in his righteousness, you're now with him. And then he challenges a common misperception that people have about grace. And that is, well, I've received, it's a free gift. I can't bring anything. You said I can't bring anything to the table so I can just, I just live the way I want because he forgives me. Paul says, no way. Because if you, if you are in him, if you've received his grace, you have, Paul says this, you have died with him. Your old life is gone. You have been buried with him. It's all gone. Your past no longer defined you. Jesus passed to find you. And that's perfect. You've been buried with him. Now you're raised up with him. And you are now living the life that he's called you. You are now alive as he is alive. And you say, well, I don't always feel alive. Don't Christians still sin? Yes, we continue to sin. But when we do, it's going against the grain. It's not who we are anymore. And we know it. It's like springtime here in Texas. Like there might be, you know, there's going to be, I think the sun is coming out. It's going to be a beautiful day. And we're hoping they get the masters in today, right? Like there's coming. Here's what happens. Springtime, storms come in. Like there's rain that comes. I mean, I mess up. I got rainy days. But here's the beautiful thing about forever Easter is that God is always doing a beautiful thing in my life. And in your life, if you know him. And even in our sin, our sin does not repel him, but instead it triggers his love for us, for you. He will not let you go. And he's bringing life, light, sunshine, constant growth, peace, and joy into your life, regardless of what you're going through. So how would you know? Let me offer this. If you were to be placed on the stand and you were, you know, someone said, Guilty. This person is a Christian. What evidence would they have to prove you guilty? What evidence would you bring? What would you say? And if in that moment you say, well, I, uh uh-oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, I've, 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 I've sought to live a good life. I mean, I like to think that people think I'm, you know, and yes, loving and I'm, but I'm really moral and, you know, I'm just, I mean, I'm trying, I'm better than most people. And I, I, I'm just trying my best friend. No, no, and no. All we've got is that Jesus Christ, the man in the middle, the man on the middle cross, I'm with him. He died for my sin. I've got nothing. I've received it by faith, not my own works. He has justified me, not my good works. I have received his grace. That's who I am. That's all I've got. Let him testify on my behalf. That's all we've got, friends. And if you have never received Christ, today is your day. In fact, let me offer further evidence that would catapult you into a life of obedience with him. A couple of things. First, baptism. Have you been baptized? He said, well, now wait, what, now you're adding to what? No, watch this. Baptism is testifying what you believe is true. Check it out. We've died with him. We're buried with him. Completely forgiven. We raised up now to walk a new life with him. 
Friends, some of you are questioning your salvation and you're not much of a witness in the world because you've not been baptized. You haven't been catapulted, obeyed him in that step of faith. And here's another. A commitment to Christ is a commitment to one another. To be a part, evidence that you follow him is to be a member of a local church. The body of Christ. Are you a member? Today's your day. And I would just advocate, you might expect me to say this. I love this church. (laughs) This is the place. We are a church that talks about God's grace every time we gather. We are a church that holds up the Bible as our authority. There is truth. And it points to the one who is the truth. We're a church that cares for the marginalized that goes throughout the world to share the gospel. And right here, we care for every person. We seek biblical justice, caring for the marginalized. We don't do politics unless it's the politic, global politics of Jesus, his kingdom, because he's our king. We're raising up boys and girls, everyone to use their gifts. To serve the Savior because he's the one who's called us all to go now and to tell. And here's the challenge for some of you here today. Because I've talked to a couple of you this, this week. For some of you, it's time to get back in the game. Don't waste your life. Easter Sunday reminds us of all that matters. And it is Christ resurrected, changing our lives. And I'll, I'll close with this twist. The final verdict has already been rendered. Whether you believe or not, Jesus does not need you to believe to make him Lord. He is Lord of all. He is the risen King and Savior forever. Amen? All that's left is for you to decide. What will be your verdict? The resurrection is the final verdict. Jesus is Lord of all. Will you bow before him? Or will you answer to him as judge in eternity? Because now all that's left is for us to trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to everybody trust and obey. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the clarity of your gospel, the good news, that you've put an explanation point an exclamation point on our lives because you are alive. We are now alive. Those of us who trust in you. And friend, right now, in this holy moment, if you've never received Christ, put a stake in the ground today. Let it be on this Easter, 2023. Say yes to him. Say, I believe. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry you've not been first Lord of my life, I give you my life. I receive what you've done for me upon the cross. Thank you for forgiving me, for justifying me. I respond as an act of worship. I give you my life. And Lord, we praise you for your church, for the ordinance of baptism that we can testify, we can, we have the privilege to testify and proclaim that you are Lord of our lives. May we do it today and every day of our lives, knowing that we find ourselves in a battle often, but it is a battle that you've already won. We are victorious in you and we praise you. And it's in your name that we pray and all God's people said, amen.